And, uh, and so we're going to have a little recap and get into the fourth sermon of section two of a renewed walk, walk in light. And it kind of sets uh, the stage, if you will, for the next part of the series, walk in wisdom. Okay, so this kind of bridges to the next, uh, perhaps maybe we'll look at two or three sermons under that one. But we're wanting to focus on this last section, I believe it's a very important part, maybe also neglected uh, part of the Christian uh, walk. But look at verse 8 of Ephesians 5. Notice what the Bible says there. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. We're going to focus on verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, our gracious God and Saviour, we thank you so much for your grace upon us. Thank you for uh, having mercy upon our dear sister, uh, Lord God, and and revealing the truth to her heart, uh, revealing that salvation is through your Son and your Son alone, by faith alone. We're so thankful, Father, uh, for your work of grace and patience and long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish but all come to repentance. And I pray, dear God, if there be anyone in this room here today that perhaps has fallen into the trap of thinking, uh, Lord, that works can save them or their uh, Christian heritage can save them, I pray that you would minister to their heart, that they may realize that they, they need, Lord God, to call upon the name of the Lord themselves by faith in a true and sincere heart. I pray that you would continue, Lord God, to, rem- to minister to us your word, help us and remind us of the truths that we've learned already. And I pray that this will be another building block in our life that will be edified, uh, Lord, to walk in the light, not to be vain in our uh, thinking and thoughts and living and uh, conversation of life, but to be sober. And I pray that you will continue to order our steps according to your word, with the help of your spirit, for your glory, Father, I ask and pray this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Under section two, Walk in Light, we looked at the first sermon. We focused on a sanctified walk, looking at verse three, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh what? saints and the saint is one that's sanctified by god through the gospel by the power of the holy spirit set apart saints not sinners that made saints yes we're sinners saved by grace but we've been translated uh, from a positional aspect like we've heard from the old man uh, to the new man we've become new creatures in christ and second we looked at uh, a submissive walk to walk in light is to have a submissive walk not only a sanctified walk, and we looked at verse 6, let no man deceive you with vain words, for, becometh, uh, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of who? Disobedience. And so there is a vast contrast between uh, the children of light and the children of darkness. And the children of light are ones that obey by faith, live according to the will of God, and the children of darkness are those that disobey. And we looked at that contrast. We also looked last week at a separated walk, verse 7. It says here, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. And that's them talking about the children of disobedience that live in darkness, that disobey God, that are not saints but sinners that haven't trusted Christ as their own personal saviour. The word partakers means to associate with or to participate and to live in... Uh, or walk in the light means that we do not associate with darkness, we do not walk with the children of disobedience, but rather the Bible says to reprove them, verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And we spoke about what that reproving meant. If you weren't here for that message, you can get it online. And uh, we, uh, you know, I labored a little on the fact that we, we're not overbearing. We share or preach or minister the truth in what? according to Ephesians 4, in what? In love. And we spent four sermons on walking in love. And so we noted the fact that 
there is a, a, a wonderful balance that the Holy Spirit gives us in walking in love and walking in light, that is walking in holiness, and that we don't want to go on one extreme, neglecting the other. Yes, we want to be loving, but we want to be holy. Yes, we want to be holy, but we want to be loving also. And so we, this morning we want to conclude walking in light by looking at a sobering walk. And I believe this is found in verse 10. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. To walk in light means we have a sober walk. No, we don't walk carelessly, aimlessly, but rather we walk soberly. To have a sober walk means to live a life that is acceptable to the Lord. In, 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 in essence, there are really two choices on the shelf. You can either walk uh, a way that pleases God or you can walk a way that pleases self and uh, I want to give you three things from our main text this morning I want to show you the principle of proving the practice of proving and then also the purposeful proving okay let's look at the first now now we're clearly admonished to be proving that's the principle proving uh, what is acceptable to the Lord and to prove means to bring to light or to put to the test to scrutinize, to examine, to try. And we do that for a purpose, and we'll look at that purpose later on. But let me just say this, we, we, we do it to know uh, the very things that, that God reveals to us that is acceptable to Him. The very principle of proving, putting things to the test, is an instruction given by God through, throughout the Scriptures. It has always been uh, someone that is endued with wisdom that would uh, test all things or prove all things before doing anything. God is always given that uh, ad admonition, especially in the book of Proverbs. We find Proverbs 4 verse 26, uh, a call to consider our ways. He says, ponder the path of thy feet. The word ponder, he has the idea to make the path uh, a place to tread upon, a, a path that is uh, prepared beforehand. Why? Because it's very clear by the second part of that verse is that God wants to establish all our ways. He doesn't want us to walk on a crooked path. He doesn't want, to walk, uh, want us to walk on a path that is corrupt. But rather he wants us to ponder the path of our feet, making sure that every step we make, every decision uh, we make, we diligently consider uh, uh, those things that are before us. Making a move without having the Word of God ponder our paths can be dangerous. I mean, how many people are suffering the consequences for their decisions because they didn't consult the Word of God? They didn't go back and say, what does the Bible say? And by the way, that is no doubt a, a principle that we live by as Bible-believing Christians, that we refer to the Word of God and say, what does the Bible say? What does God's Word say on this matter? And there's, there isn't a lot of people doing that today. And if it's done, it's, 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 it's really skimming over, not diligently giving heed to uh, what is before us. And, and, and there's reasons for that, and we'll get into those reasons later on. <clears throat> we are encouraged to make decisions based upon the facts of God's Word and not based upon feelings. In Proverbs 28, verse 26, he that trusteth in his own heart is a what? Is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he should be delivered. One of the greatest dangers is to make decisions based upon our own feelings or our own thinking. It's so dangerous. The Bible is very clear that there is a way that seemeth, or uh, uh, which seemeth right on the man, but the end thereof are the ways of what? Death. Isaiah says, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And so... When we live proving what is right and what is wrong, we walk in the light, becoming sober people, people of discretion, people of wisdom. Look at Proverbs 22, verse 3. A prudent man foreseeth evil, and he hideth himself. But the simple pass on, and are what? They're punished. We're taught to look well, not to be naive, or not to uh, look, uh, be gullible, but to look well unto our goings. To, to see in advance. And, and by the way, it, and, and we'll get there again, the Word of God helps us see in advance. It gives us those eyes to see into the future. 
and uh, also see the ramifications for making decisions that are based upon feelings and not the Word of God. The Bible says, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man look well to his what? The simple means to be gullible, to be naive, to accept everything and anything that we hear, that we see, or perhaps how we feel, what we think. A man of God once said, indeed, the naive tend to believe everything that they hear or read. Rather, a prudent person will take time to think through the matter. God is simply saying that we must be a people of discernment. And I believe the Hebrew writer alludes to that in chapter 5, verse 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised, notice this word here, to discern both good and evil. Today our society is warped. It is so dark it's not funny. They call good evil and evil good. And it's even creeping into the churches. What God esteems to be an abomination, man esteem, esteem it to be something that is marvellous and wonderful under the banner of love. Under, under the banner of feelings. This is creeping so subtly in the church. You know, they, they cannot discern their left hand from their right hand. They cannot discern that, uh, you know, a male from female. They don't even know how to define what a woman is. I asked one of my daughters who is uh, about five years old at the time, I said, come here, have I ever spoken to you what, what you know, the definition of what a woman is? And she said, no. I said, what is a woman? She said, it's a lady. It's a good answer. It's a lady. It's not a man. It's a lady. Very simple to define what it is. Because the Bible helps us make that distinction right from the beginning. But throughout time, for some reason, men have been putting their head in the sand or being deceived by the evil one. They're so entrenched in wickedness and sin and iniquity and darkness that they don't know the difference between light and darkness. That which is good and that which is evil. And so this leads us to the next thought. The Word of God is the very thing we use to prove what is acceptable. That's our measuring stick. And I know everyone would go and say, we use the Word of God and we're Bible-believing too. And they hold the Bible, claim a Bible, use verses out of context, abuse and trash the Word of God for their own benefit and advantage. We never want to come to the place that we are doing that. We want to be honest Bible, biblical students using the Word of God uh, you know, in, a, in, in, in a way that is not deceitful, in a way that is transparent, in a way that honours God. The Word of God is the very thing that would help us be sanctified. The Word of God is the very thing that would help us be submissive and separated. And even in our context today, the Word of God is the very thing that will keep us sober-minded. In our text in Ephesians chapter 5, we see Paul encourage the husbands that the Word of God has the sanctifying power to make the church holy and pure before his sight. Ephesians 5 verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing, by the, by the, uh, by the washing of water by the Word. And so this is how God uses uh, his word to get a hold of a Bible-believing Christian that has trusted his son. He wants to separate him, sanctify him, use him, make him sober. In, uh, you know, the children of God ought to, not, ought to be known by wisdom. In other words, we would use the uh, worldly vo uh, vo uh, you know, proverb, he had his head screwed on. <laughs> Is that right? He's got it all together. Well, we need to get it biblically right and have it all together according to God's Word. The light of God's Word is the very instrument we need to help put everything to the test. It is the Spirit of God, there's no doubt, that helps us make sober decisions based upon the principles of God's Word given to us from one generation to the next. 
Proverbs 119 uh, and verse 105, the Bible speaks about the Word of God being a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so the Word of God is full of godly principles that give us light to our feet, that order our steps in the future. Psalm 119, uh, 133. Notice the psalmist's attitude here. He says to God, order my steps in thy what? In thy word, and let not any iniquity, any iniquity, have dominion over me. Look at his heart. He wanted God to order his steps. He didn't want any iniquity to overcome him. And by the way, we uh, looked at this at Wednesday night prayer meeting and the devotion that sin will keep you from being a witness, but sin will also keep you from this book. You can mark that down. When someone is not proving the Word of God, diligently referring to the Word of God, seeking God's favor, seeking God's wisdom, you know that they're independently doing whatever they want to do. They're wise in their own conceit, making decisions, uh, you know, flippantly without consulting the Word of God. I would even submit to you those little sins in our life ought to be scrutinized by God and His Word. You know, because they, they do. They, these little things can bother us. Little, little sins that we don't confess and see uh, and being brought out to our attention can actually hinder our walk and hinder the light that God has given. We, all, we almost look at the gross sin out there and I'm not undermining that. Sin is sin. And there are those sins that actually will cripple, cripple our whole life. But there's even these little sins that will hinder the work of God in our life. When I was studying, there was this little fly that wouldn't leave me alone. And for some time, I was just doing this the whole time. And I just wanted to study God's word. And I was just doing this until I squashed it. Got it and put it in the bin. And I, think, I thought you know, the Lord allowed me to think those little things can bother you. You know... I use the illustration of those little pebbles in your shoe. When you're walking, when you're trying to walk uprightly according to the Word of God, and that you have, you know, a little pebble in your shoe, what do you normally do? What's the first thing that you normally do? You normally just do this to see if you can move it because you perhaps got no time to, or, you know, you're walking and you just don't, can't be bothered taking your shoe off and tipping it out. So you're just doing these ones, hoping that it will move over. And then later on throughout the day, it comes back under again. Well, the best thing to do is remove it quickly. Take your shoe off and be done with it. And so these little things, the psalmist had a heart that he didn't want any iniquity to have dominion over him. Why? Because he wanted the Word of God to order his life. Prove all things takes time. Diligent study. Proving takes diligence. It takes discipline. Uh, Paul says to Timothy, study to show thyself approved on the God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A Bible teacher once says, the word study has nothing to do with books and teachers. It means to be diligent, be zealous. The emphasis in this paragraph is that a workman needs to be diligent in his labors so that he will not be ashamed when his work is inspected. In other words, you can have all the resources and do nothing with them. And by the way, it's been said that you read many books but live in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with Christian uh, curriculum that are good Bible-based books. They're similar to uh, a, a Bible teacher teaching you from the pulpit, but it's on paper. But we need to live in the book. We need, we, do, we need to make sure that this Bible, by the way, is called the book of books, Biblos. It's the book of all books. It's the only book that will read you it's a living book. This ought to be the book that we uh, embrace and, and that we follow after. I'm glad for those books that write about the Bible. But listen, without the Bible, we have nothing to write. Amen. Without the Bible, we wouldn't even be able to speak here before you this morning. And the reason that we have a message is because of this book. The reason that, that we have principles and we, we, we're able to know them is because of this wonderful uh, word, which, which again... The modern day church wants to undermine in a very subtle way. Very subtle. And it's very sad. But let's move on to the second point. Not only the principle of proving, but now the practice of proving. It says here, proving what is acceptable. What is acceptable. Now there are many things that uh, we must put to the test. There are many things 
that we must prove to see if they're acceptable. Acceptable means things that are well-pleasing. We can put it like this, things that are biblical, things that God approves of. A preacher once said, those who walk in the light also find out what is acceptable to the Lord. They put every thought, word and action to the test. What does the Lord think about this? How does it appear in his presence? Every area of life comes under the searchlight, conversation, standard of living, clothes, books, business, pleasure, entertainments, furniture, friendships, holidays, cars and sports. Everything. Oh, you say that's a bit hard. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, well, we're told to. We're told to. And the Bible helps us, no doubt, to put to the test those things that are important to put to the test. And I would say it's important to put to the test false teachers because they're always coming on the back end, if you will, creeping in to any church, whether it's broad or local, whether it's through the internet or through uh, a church door. They're always trying to creep in and undermine the word of God and undermine the deity of Christ and undermine sin and sinful living. Always, they creep in. They call, uh, they're preachers of turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And so the Word of God helps us know how these creeps look like so we can stay away from them. It's amazing to me how many people give ear to false teachers and they don't even know they're listening to one. Because they're naive and gullible. They haven't come to a point of uh, you know, full age and being mature to sense sound teaching from that which is not. First John 4 verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets, which come unto you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. He says in verse 20, Wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. I'm sure people know how to detect a bad apple from a good apple when they see it in the box. My kids know how to detect a bad apple from a good apple. They give it to me when it's bad. They want me to eat it. <laughs> I crush it and put it in the chicken feed. I wonder why this apple's not eaten and then there you go, it's bruised and they took a bite and it's, ugh, that's a bad apple. And some of the principles that these false teachers teach, you practice them long enough and it will veer you away from God, not toward God. It's that deadly. I mean, we heard, we heard a testimony today of a lady living in, in Christianity for years, being led by false teaching. I was led in false teaching in Catholicism for about 20 years. 20 years. until it took one person to show me the simple gospel and it was music to my ears. I couldn't believe it, that my God will become a man to take my place on that cross to die for me and that I could be sure that heaven is my home because of what he did. It just took that, that and God used John, John 3.16 a simple verse, and I don't know why it's so controversial. It's so clear, so basic. And a lot of these false teachers want to move you from the simplicity that is in Christ with another gospel, another spirit, and another Jesus, Paul says to the Corinthians. Proverbs 14, verse 33, Wisdom resteth in the heart of him that have understanding, but that which is in the midst of fools is what? Made known. You are able to, by the word of God, see how foolish some of these preachers are. I can't even believe how the charismatic movement gets a crowd of people by seeing people like Benny Hinn and all these other people entertain goats and have a little stage play there. And people are, wow, well, nothing. Read the book of Acts and you'll see that that's not a church. It's a, it's, a, it's a circus. Read your Bible. People just don't have the sense to distinguish between that which is a phony and that which is, you know, truth. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 11, Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure or whether it be right. Proverbs 21, verse 8, the way of a man is forward and strange, but as for the pure, his work is what? Right. And how do we measure his work to be right? We can just look at the Bible and see if it matches. 
what he's teaching, how he's living, what he's saying, what he's doing. Sometimes they say good things, but it's mixed with bad things. The Bible helps us prove not only false teachers, but also it helps us prove our own salvation. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians verse 13, verse 5, uh, chapter 13, verse 5, examine yourselves. That word examine is the same. Prove your own selves. Put yourself to the test. Now, you say, why was Paul saying this to the Corinthians? Because the Corinthians were undermining his apostleship, his, his, his you know, calling, if you will, to be separated under the gospel. And uh, if you're undermining his person uh, uh, in, 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 in preaching, then you're really undermining what he's preached to you. Because Paul preached the gospel very clearly to them. And he said, he says, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Look at this. Here it comes again. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your, your own selves how Jesus Christ is in you, except you be what? A reprobate. That means to be rejected. There are many Christians who doubt their salvation and wrestle and wonder if they're saved or not. I would say to you, why don't you prove yourself? Examine yourself. You say, how? Under the teaching of God's word. Does it match what God is saying? There's a reason why you're doubting. There's a reason why you're struggling. The greatest examination for doubting uh, you know, your salvation is to come under the light of God's word. And the best thing that you can uh, do, Paul says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? Word of God. Look, listen, it's a great danger to try to seek after a man, parents, pastor, and try to say, you know, am I saved? Well, God knows if you are. I can only show you how to be saved, but I'm not going to give you assurance because I don't, know, I don't know your heart. You know, a lot of people, we heard it again in the testimony. I've asked Jesus into my heart. Did you know Jesus gets into your heart by the Holy Spirit by a byproduct of getting saved? Because you can say, Jesus, come into my heart and not have faith. But when you have faith in Christ and believe in the Lord because you see your sin for what it is and you see the great Saviour for who He is and you see what the cross meant and you call on the Lord, guess what? He comes into your heart. He, he lives in you. You become a new creature. But people are taught, Jesus, come into my heart, but they're not taught the whole counsel of the Gospel. They're just taught these little prayers that we do not see in the Scripture. And sometimes I know what they mean but it is the responsibility of the preacher or the person that is sharing the gospel to be very clear in their presentation. How many people give false assurance to people that don't even understand the gospel? They just regurgitate verses. They manipulate them to make them, uh, 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 to, to make, them make a decision and manipulate them again. And you don't even know their hearts. It's sad, but it happens. In the book of James, the word of God is likened unto a mirror and is able to show us where we stand with God. Jesus said and challenges the religious people to search the scriptures. He says in John 5 verse 39, search the scriptures, search them, prove them, search, go, be diligent, examine, for in them you think you have eternal life and they are which testify of me. To search the scriptures means we search diligently to look into intently to investigate Jesus knew if they took the time to look in the book of books in the scriptures in the law of the prophets to see what the father wrote through the prophets he knew that they will find the truth regarding his person and when they believe they will be made free because he knew you know the religious rulers on on face value you thought hey, they loved this, the bible but they didn't they didn't you thought they were just doctors and scribes of the law and meticulously were looking to see what does the law of God say so we can do it. Uh, many of them were fakes and phonies and Jesus knew. That's why he uh, proclaimed woe and judgment in Matthew chapter 23 for being a hypocrite. Notice Paul's assurance. I love this, what Paul says, because it makes it personable. He says this, he says, I'm not ashamed. What wasn't he ashamed of? Being separated, you look at the verses prior to this, being separated to the gospel, being a preacher, he gets persecuted for it, but he says, I'm not ashamed. Why, Paul? He says, I'm not ashamed, for I know. I know. 
whom I have believed. By the way, it's a personal decision that you have to make once you have been given the light of God's word and the gospel shines in your heart with the help of the Holy Spirit that convicts you of sin, righteousness, of, and judgment. You have to make a decision when God shows you your condition and, and leads you to the Son and you see it for what it is. Ah, oh, he says, I, but God doesn't believe for you. We've been learning about the false teaching of Calvinism, like God gives them the faith. It's a gift. And, uh, and, and, and he, it's almost like he believes for them. No, 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 no. Paul says, I have believed. It was his faith. And by the way, faith is not a work. Why? Because Paul contrasts faith in chapter number two of Ephesians with works. He already makes that distinction between faith and work. So faith cannot be a work. And the gift is salvation. You're saved by grace. Grace is the love that God has shown toward us to, to give us his son. And, uh, and, and salvation is the gift. And faith is the way you receive it. He says, I've believed. I know who I believed. There's all I, 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 I. I don't think the Calvinists will like this verse. Paul, is it all about I, I, I? Yeah, well, it's a more, why? Because it's God's responsibility to save us when we believe. We can't save ourselves. Salvation is of the Lord, and we know that. But having faith doesn't mean we're saving ourselves. We're asking God to save us. That's all it is. You can't make it more than what, what it's not. It's a red herring. It, 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 is, it is a smoke screen. It is, you know, a, a straw man to set up and say, oh, you had faith. Well, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And by the way, you were condemned based upon your unbelief. Did you know that? If God condemns you based upon your unbelief, that means you could have believed. <laughs> it's not difficult to understand but somehow the scholars and those that are learned want to tell us something different. But I thank God for the simplicity of his word, especially when it comes in the era of salvation. The Bible helps us. And by the way, he continues to go and say, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that salvation, that which I have committed unto him against that day. God's responsibility, our responsibility, I have committed, he's able to keep. You see the responsibility that God has given us? And his responsibility to keep us? He saves us and keeps us safe. By the way, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, we are kept by the power of God. We can't, I thank God, lose our salvation, but you don't have to be a Calvinist to believe that. You don't. It's amazing how people want to label you. If you're not a Calvinist, you're an Arminius. If you're not an Arminius, you're a Calvinist. Well, why can't I just be a Biblicist? Oh, we all, we're all Biblicists. Don't you know, Charlie, that that's also a straw man? We are Bible-believing Christians too. Well, you know, even the child is known by his doings. You know, I got, I got deceived for over 24 years by the Catholic system, and I'm not ready to be deceived again by anyone else, the charismatic movement, uh, the, the Calvinist movement, I'm not ready to be deceived by them either. I'm not. It's not going to happen. Because I not only know my Bible, but listen, I know the God of my Bible, and I don't know the relationship you have with the God of this book. Because you know what? Many people use this book as a theological textbook, and they detach the head from the heart. Listen, if you detach the head from the heart, you cannot be saved. How many people know the truth here, but it hasn't hit them here? And I believe that's what James is talking about in James chapter number two. You can know the facts like the devils do, but if there's no heart, my friend, it's all for nothing. Good on you, you know the facts. The devils know the facts, but they don't have saving faith. And by the way, James chapter two is how the, uh, my, my uh, you know, Catholic teacher once said, that you need to prove your faith by your works. In other words, you need to do works to show that you have faith. So that's not what James is talking about. He's not undermining the Apostle Paul. What's James talking about? James is talking about is your work will be shown by your faith. It means this. If you have genuine faith, it will work. It will be made manifest. And you know what? That, be, that can actually be collaborated with a lot of other passages of scriptures. And I'll give you one of them. We know that we have passed from death to life when we love the who? The brethren. 
We know we've passed from death to life. Jesus said you pass from death to, from death to life when you believe. And John says, well, you know, whether your faith is genuine or not, we know that you've passed from death to life when you love the brethren. And you're not like Cain, who slew his brother. It gives us a perfect example of what James is talking about because, you know, true, genuine faith will manifest itself like Abraham, who is the representative of who? The Jews. Rahab, who is a Gentile, who by their works, what you do, hide, you know, what you do. Did she climb a mountain? Did she light candles, give money to the poor? You know, we know and understand that over here it's manifested in the sense of, yeah, help a brother when you see him in need. It's, it's demonstrated, but you know, everybody demonstrates their faith in a different way depending where they're at with the Lord. Faith can be seen. Faith is not dormant. It can be seen. Man, this guy's got faith. Look how they love God. Look how they serve God. And I know some people can serve God and it looks like they have faith, but only, know, only God knows the heart because the motive, as we're going to get there in a moment, plays a big part with why you do what you do. What you do. The Bible helps us prove our works. Galatians 6, verse 3, For if any man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself, but let every man prove his own work. And then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. And of course, this, this is work after the fact that you're saved. This goes for the spiritual man. Any one of us that is, is susceptible to be deceived. This is why it's imperative to evaluate our service, our ministry by the word of God. Is our work that we do for the Lord acceptable unto God? Albert Barnes says uh, regarding this, he says, Let him compare himself with the word of God and the infallible rule which he has given and by which he had to be judged in, the, in, that, in that last great day. And that's the word of God. And of course, the Bible helps us prove our hearts. The word of God is so powerful that it is able to pierce through the bone and marrow and go straight to, this, to our hearts and to prove the sincerity thereof. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints of marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts, and look at this, and the intents of the what? The heart. The word of God is able to pierce through our flesh and bone, aiming to the heart of man. The truth is only God can prove our hearts, and it is God who uses the pure words to test and prove and examine our hearts. Proverbs 17, verse 3, The finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. Proverbs 21, 2, Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the heart. Amen? God, through his word, is the one who can prove our motive, prove our integrity. And that's what David did. He says, Lord, judge me, examine me, prove me, try me. He wanted to see, Lord, you know I've been walking in truth, but I want you to try me. In a, it, it, the, I think one of the greatest, greatest deceptions is believing you are right when you're wrong. Brethren, it is the pure word of God that is able to prove if we have pure motives. Psalm 12, verse 6, the word of God, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. And it's God's word that will lead us to the place of reality and not fantasy. It is able to show us our true condition. Outside of God's word, you'll never know it. You'll never know the truth. And it all comes down to of how you value this book and the sincerity of your heart and wanting to be scrutinized. And so we know and understand that a lot of people don't want to be diligent. Brethren, beware of tacking God on everything that you do. In other words, you use God's name in vain. You know, God said when God didn't say. You say, how do you do that? Well, people misuse the scripture all the time. They're not honest with what, God, yeah, what the word is. They try to manipulate the scripture to support their lifestyle. Like, for example, to justify their social drinking. Oh, they go to John chapter 4, verse 46. Jesus made water in the wine. And to justify their sensual dancing, they go straight to, to David in 2 Samuel. Well, David danced before the Lord. 
Well, if you do those studies on, on dancing before the Lord, the Bible says that he was like jumping and leaping. He wasn't dancing in a central, central sexual way. Uh, you know, they justify their sinful lifestyle by going to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not. One of their favorite verses in the Bible. Keep reading. They want to justify their outward stubborn rebellion by using 1 Samuel 16. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Yeah, he does. He really does. But they want to go to these verses and misuse them to justify their sinful living. When proving, we must remember the ABCs of testing by the Word of God. You say, what do you mean by that? I say, number one, you know, letter A, don't be afraid. Afraid? What do you mean by that? Well, the Word of God ought not to be a threat to you. It ought not to be, you know, uh, a sense where, you know what, if I really study this, uh, I might have to change. And I don't know if I'm ready to change. I don't know if I want to change. Uh, or perhaps to have, make decisions that they don't want to make. But you know what my Bible says? Perfect love casts out fear. And John says this, that the love of God, uh, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And look at this. And His commandments are not what? They're not a burden. They're a pleasure. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't let the Word of God threaten you. It's our help and comfort. Does it convict us? Yes. But it's good. It's good conviction. It's good to know the right way. It's good to know, hey, listen, reprove me. Smite me, Lord. Show me where I've gone wrong. And I want to, you know, there's one thing about God. He doesn't deceive you. And he does it because he wants you to know the truth so you can walk uprightly. Second, we see the letter B. Don't be biased. When it comes to the word of God, we must set aside all presuppositions. Everything that we've learned in tradition. You know, when I got saved from being a Catholic, you know how I many, when I prayed, you know what I continued to do? My friend said, look, you don't have to do that. There's nothing in the Bible to do that. He said, but, but I said to him, but I like it. He goes, oh, all right. Then later on, I learned how to pray. Thank God for that. And I, yeah, and I saw you pray to the Father, not to the Holy Spirit, by the way. You pray to the Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus through the Spirit. Nowhere in the Bible do we see that we talk to the Spirit of God. No, we talk to the Heavenly Father. And God talks to us through His Word. And yes, the, minute, the, the Spirit of God ministers to us by using the Word of God to, 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 to put a fire in our bones, to convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment. It's wonderful. But I got stuck on it for some time. Why? It was tradition. You know, I've, you know the Catholicism taught you a lot about Mary more than Jesus. And man, I used to love Mary as a Catholic. And when I got saved, I still loved her. And there's nothing wrong with loving her. But there's a difference with loving and respecting someone and treating him like a god. She was my goddess. And so you know what I used to do? I, used to, I realized that Jesus is the only way and that you can pray to God through Jesus, not through Mary. But you know what I used to do? Uh, by the way, Jesus, can you, can you say hello to Mary? That's what I used to do because I was attached to her. Mate, it was hard to let go. I thought I was going to commit sin. I dishonored the mother of God. And so don't have any presupposition, preconceived. Don't be biased. Uh, we must allow the Word of God to speak. If we come to the Word of God with any preconceived notion or suppositions, guess what? We're always going to look at them through that. Just take it off and see what the Bible says. Oh, but don't you know that I've always believed this for years? Yeah. Yeah. I do. Maybe the Word of God will help you believe the truth about what you, you know, believed for years that was wrong. Amen. You don't believe you can be wrong? I believe I can be wrong. And I thank God when we read the Word of God, it confirms what we believe to be true. And there's nothing wrong with that. But don't come with a biased attitude. C, don't be a coward. Don't be a coward. Once you know the truth, submit to the authority of God's Word. Do it. Oh, there's going to be re repercussions. Yes. I'm going to be persecuted. Yes. I might lose my spouse. Probably. That's what happens when you put Jesus first and, and the Word of God first. You might lose things. Your reputation. Probably. 
Don't be a coward. Obey what you learn from God's word. Be a Berean. I want you to see the, the testimony of these Bereans in Acts chapter 17. Look at verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night on the Berea. By the way, you know why they were escaping? For preaching the truth of God's word. Were running almost for their lives and God wasn't finished with them yet. They weren't yet to be martyrs at that particular point. God still wanted to use them. They went to Berea, who coming hither went in the synagogues of the Jews. Look at, the, look at verse 11. And these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? In that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They were more noble means they were high in rank. In other words, they were more commendable, more honourable. Because they took the time, if you will, to search the scriptures. What made them noble? Well, they were ready. Their mind were ready. They had zeal. They had determination. They were extremely open to know the truth. They wanted to seek the truth from God's word. They were eager. They searched it daily. That's how eager they were. On a daily basis, they'll go back and see what Paul was saying, if it was true, and they'll go back with a ready mind. They had, they had no preconceived ideas. I mean, if this is what Paul's saying about Christ and his coming, that the Old Testament foretold, we want to see the prophets. We want to see the law about what, what, what they prophesied about the Lord Jesus Christ. They were open. They were ready to see what the Bible was saying in their day regarding their Son of God. They were proving and the Holy Spirit records the testimony of these Bereans. The Holy Spirit records for us through the writer, Luke, about their character. They weren't indifferent to the Word of God. They weren't flippant. They were serious, sober-minded people. In verse 11, they searched the Scriptures daily. Look at this. Whether those things were so. And I like here that we don't see anything from the Holy Spirit recording down through Luke, that Paul was offended. Don't you know I'm the Apostle Paul? How dare you, you know, challenge me? No. Mate, challenge it. You know what? Paul knew what he preached was true, that if you go and search it, you'll find it to be true. He knew that. <laughs> and that anyone should be doing that. It's only when you want to hide it. No, 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 we don't want to show you that. We just want to teach you that. You know, you know back in the day in Catholicism, they didn't let you have a Bible. Some people find it strange that you bring your Bible with you. Why? Why is it strange? It's actually a wonderful thing. Yeah, well, it's a bit old-fashioned. Well, use a tablet then. You know, you, you, if you don't have the Word of God with you, how are you supposed to search the Scriptures to see? Have it on your phone. Carry it with you. Take it everywhere. Without the word of God, we can't live. Listen, no man lives by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. For everything, not just doctrine, but our way of living. You think God wants me to do this or do that, go there, listen to this. I mean, they searched the scriptures. They weren't, you know, a flippant. They were, you know, I would have believed that the Apostle Paul would have been thrilled to see them. Man. These guys are not taking my word for it. They're testing it to see what God said, said it, and they're going to see if it was true. And you know how we know this? Because he spoke highly of Thessal the Thessalonians. He was thanking God that they didn't receive it as the word of Paul, but indeed as the word of God. So how much more about re regarding these Bereans? Ready to search. How, how many of us honestly would say, would open this Bible every day to learn from what God says so I know how to speak, I know how to live, I know how to act and react, I know, you know, how to, you know, deal with this matter. How many of us? And then, by the way, that also goes to how many of us will go to counsel from our parents, uh, those that are in authority, those perhaps that are teachers, would say, hey, what do you think about this? Does the Bible say anything about that? How many of us care about what the Bible says about everyday life? This brings us to the last thing is in closing. The purpose of proving. Proving what is acceptable to Charlie. 
Does it say that? Proving what is acceptable to John MacArthur. Does it say that? No. Proving what is acceptable unto the Pope. Does it say that? No. It says proving what is acceptable unto who? God. How do you prove that is acceptable unto God? We'll go to his word and say, hey. oh, that's just your opinion. No, God said it. I'm quoting you the Bible. Do you want to see? No, 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 I don't want to see. What do you want to see? Why, all of a sudden you have an elliptic fit. Why? You know how many people say they're Bible-believing Christians and when you get out to pull it, I don't want to to see it. Why? Don't you want to see what God says? I mean, we want to see what's pleasing to God. Don't you want to see God's will on the matter? Uh, Well, this is the whole purpose, isn't it? Proving what is acceptable unto God, knowing what, what pleases God in every area of our life. Look at verse 17 in Ephesians 5. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is where we must start and finish. This is where the goal is. The pure motive in proving. This is the supreme in- intention of for proving. In other words, we begin to prove all things that we might say something like this. Does this please God? Is this acceptable to God? Is this biblically sound according to God? Is this the heart of God? Is this something that the Lord will want me to do? Is this something that the Lord wants me to, uh, you know, s- uh, wants me to have? Is this the place the Lord wants me to go? Testing and proving is to learn by clear, convic- convicting and c- convincing evidence that truly honours God. Romans says it, Chapter 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, acceptable unto Charlie. No. Acceptable unto God. Which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of god this is the end of all that we do is say god does this please you my life please you the decisions that i make please you i want to please you because like i said in the beginning there's either you're living to please god or you're living to please yourself they're the only two you know choices that you have on the shelf In Psalm 119, notice the attitude of the psalmist. He says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. You know why he wanted the word of God? Because he wanted to please God. You know why he hid it in his heart? He wanted to know everything about God's word. So when he would be faced in a certain situation, he would say, I wonder, is this going to please God? If this is not going to please God, I'm out of here. You know, similar to what Joseph did. You know what Joseph did? Because he knew the law and he loved God. He said, when Potiphar's wife came to tempt him, he said this, how can I commit this great wickedness and sin against God? There's no way in the world I'm going to sin against God. I know the law. I know what God has said. He wasn't only afraid about the repercussions, but he was afraid of displeasing God. Mate, if you lived like that, what a change that will do to your life as a Christian. Oh, I don't want so-and-so to see me. God's watching every time. He sees you every time. A lot of people, they're like chameleons. They change one doctrine, so we can fit a certain group. Change convictions to suit a certain group, uh, a group of social people here and there, and they change. Everything's in the bin. They change their whole life. They're like chameleons. They change. Listen, you convinced by God's word, you convicted by God's word. There are going to be some things that will stick. If you were living according to man's word, they may change, depending what they taught you. If they taught you the truth and you were convinced, it will stick. If they taught you error, it will fail. 
But sometimes it's not based upon the preacher preaching truth, it's based upon your heart. Did you receive it as the word of God, pleasing to God, or did you just receive it so you can show yourself, wow, you're something in front of these people? That makes the difference. Because it will be short-lived if you didn't do it for the Lord. You know how Jesus lived? The greatest example. In John chapter 8, verse 29, he said this, The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. What a testimony. What a testimony. To prove all things, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, to hold fast to that which is good and abstain from all appearances of evil. To hold fast means to keep and not lose. Lord, is this pleasing to you? I'm convinced by your word, and I want to know if it is. And if it is, I'm going to hold on to it. I don't care what Joe Blow thinks. I don't care if these people go by the wayside. Listen, my life is not based upon that pastor, that preacher. My life is based upon what God is doing in my heart through his word. Because if that pastor fails and falls, guess what? I can still go. I can move forward. Because my relationship wasn't contingent based upon a pastor that once preached truth and then fell in adultery. Or once preached truth and then fell in error. No, my conviction and my life is based upon I want to please my heavenly father. I love his word. It's so tempting to go with the flow of our culture. But when you go back to the word of God and you see what God has already affirmed in your heart and you're refreshed and you say, I'm normal again. Lord, this is what you've done 20 years ago and you're still working in my heart. I don't care if that person goes down the slippery slope. I'm staying where I am based upon your truth. And you know what? I had to cipher through so many truth versus tradition. Because there's so much tradition in Christian living. And you have to cipher. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. I want to keep to the truth. Tradition that doesn't affect the Word of God is fine. But I'll never compromise the Word of God, the truth, over tradition. And you shouldn't either. Don't let go of the very thing that God has convinced you very clearly in His Word. Test it by His Word. Be convicted by God. Let the truth be settled. And listen, and go and obey the Lord. Walk in the light. Be sober men and women. Sound sound speech that cannot be condemned. Don't be flippant. Have your head right. Gird up the loins of your mind. Saturate yourself in this book. See what pleases God. For when men speak, I'll be able to know. I don't care who it is. That doesn't sound right. Ah, You go back and I thought it didn't. I thought it didn't. Or, that's not what I've been taught. Oh, didn't know that was in the Bible. You can go either way. May God give us a heart to prove what is acceptable unto him. To live a life full of light, pleasing to God. Amen? Let's pray.